you very much. Yep, cool. Um, hopefully everyone can see. Uh, he's already done my introduction, but uh, yeah, I've just taken all the, um, all the agile call aid and done every single course there is to do it. But uh, I'm a coder at heart, um, basically. So um, this session is, I, actually, I'm gonna go back a slide. I stole it from these guys. Um, I watched a presentation on it once, I went, that's amazing. But they're based in the US and they're never gonna come over and teach it. So I've done this in a few places. I've actually been cheeky and done it in the States as well. Um, but uh, I found it a really good way of teaching the basics of TDD and what the benefits of TDD are to non-technical people. So it's like, how many people are devs in the room, roughly? It's so about half, half-ish. Um, but every time you start talking about TDD and testing, project managers just go, just get it delivered. I just want to deliver, I don't care about testing. Um, but once I've taken them through this, it actually, their, their mind goes, actually, it's better that we do it this way. Um, I did it with a company down in London and the managing director came up to me afterwards and went, basically, we're wasting money by not doing this. And I was like, yeah. And they changed their whole mindset and their profits went up. So that's a win for me. Um, so some housekeeping. Um, happy to see people have their phones out, talking, uh, having side conversations, tweet, Facebook, rave about it, it's all great, um, and basically have fun. Um, the one thing around that that I will do, um, has anyone ever gone to an open space where they've done like the, the hand gestures and stuff like that? So if the noise, if, if I want to bring the noise down, I'll put my hand up, and if you see me put my hand up, if you put your hand up, the whole room will put their hand up and the whole room will go quiet really quickly. Um, in general, that works. We'll see how that works. People have got the backs to me, it's, uh, it's a bit different. Um, so, first thing I want to do is just quickly type, run over the types of testing that we have. Now we've all gone through the whole testing pyramid. We have this unit test at the bottom. We have loads of them. They run really fast and everything's great. And then we have integration tests. They're a bit slower, so we have fewer of those. And then we have some UI tests and user interface tests. And then hopefully we have some testers doing exploratory testing, which is really important for us. And that's the, that's the holy grail that everyone wants to get to. But what we find is most people probably have that. Um, well, do that, no, they prob prob probably have more of that and it's just manual testing for the whole thing. Um, and that becomes really slow. Every time we do a release, it takes us five days to do it. Um, you know, and it just slows everyone down. So we need to start to bring in um, automation as much as possible at certain levels. Um, I'm having an interesting conversation with the test team, the, the company I'm working at at the moment, and in their mindset, automation is the full stack. And it's like, yeah, that would be really slow and brittle and horrible and things like that. And they're like, yeah, no, we need to do it. It's like, no, test at these different levels and we can actually make it faster and stuff. And I'm convincing them slowly, but it's all fun. So one of the big things people have to remember is bugs cost a lot of money. Um, and as we look at when we introduce the bugs, how, how quick we can actually get it. While we're building it, it's a lot cheaper than it is post-release and during testing. So this is the area we're looking at is design and building it is where we're gonna actually find the bug um, you know, during those periods. So hopefully doing TDD will, will, will help us. So we're gonna do the first step straight out. So it's open up, uh, this is bag one. There are two bags. I'll bring out the second bag later. So there should be a bag each. Um, and what I'd like you to do is build a person and a house out of Lego. Um, there are some orange longy things that will help you take them apart if some of the bits are all stuck together. Um, so, just a person and a house. So, 30 seconds. So I'm, I'm doing business time now, so 30 seconds, 10 seconds. Right, done, right, okay, so. Who hasn't, who hasn't, who's only got a person or only got a house? Who's only got one? So there's a couple of people only with one. Well, from that point of view, you've not met our requirements. Um, you've wasted most of our time on stuff, but thank you anyway. Who used all their pieces to build their person in house? Right, well you're the people who have spent six months developing something really simple and used every single tool in the book and cost me an absolute fortune and all I wanted was a person and a house. 
And that generally is what happens. So um, admire your work, take a picture, because we will take them apart. So if you, if you want to have a uh, thing around it, yeah, please take a picture and admire your work. So in the TDD space, there are two books that I 150% recommend to anyone. The first one is Test Driven Development by Example by Kent Beck. We've all heard Kent Beck talk around XP and different fun things. And we've got Growing Object Orientated Software Guided by a Test, also known as the Goose Book. Um, Seb Rose, who spoke here before, he he's, talks about this book in one of his sessions and he Googles it and all the different books you can get that come up as Goose are quite funny. Um, so Steve Freeman and Nat Price both are uh, based in London, both freelancers. Um, always updating their blogs and coming up with some really great stuff. Um, and out of the two, Test Driven Development by Example is the Chicago School of is it Chicago Chicago School of Thought, and this is the London School of Thought. One's mockist and one isn't. Um, so as far as I remember, growing object orientation is about mocking things out and fake it before you make it, and all that sort of groovy stuff. And uh, ports and adapters, really cool sort of ideas to go through. Uh, I don't dive into that too much because that's a design paradigm that uh, some people do. So what is the goal of TDD? Ron Jeffries, another great guy from the Agile world, he says it creates clean code that works. That's what we want, right? That's, that's how we move forward with it. If we don't have clean code, it becomes harder for us to develop. It becomes harder for us to put, you know, we, we've all been on that, that um, Greenfield project where we could put a project, we could put the first story in in days. And then that Greenfield project turns brown. And then all of a sudden, that story takes six months to get in there. So TDD is about actually helping clean that code and keep it going. Um, it's a predictable way to develop. You know when you're finished without having to worry about a long bug trail. So the whole point around it is you come up and, you, and it's really unintuitive to, to, to people who do it is to write your test first to say, actually, this is what I expect to happen at the end. And this is how I expect to do it. And you can drive out a lot of design around that. And what's really nice around it is you can sort of ask the right questions really early on in your development cycle. Go, actually, how does that work? Um, but we can get that also from BDD, which I don't cover in this one, but I'm a big advocate of that. But the two together actually do work quite well. Gives you a chance to learn everything there is to learn from your code base. How many of you have actually done a proof of concept that then went to production? Probably quite a few people, right? Um, 18 years later, you're still supporting it. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so from that, if you thought about it, well, if I put that together, I understood that. Now, if I rewrite it, um, I'd learn a lot more from it. I learned a lot from it. Uh, you know, as developers, we don't try to like, delete the code we did because we feel that's wrong. But if we did and then redid it, it'd be better second time because we've learned a lot from it. So you know, if you, if you just use the first thing you slap together, you haven't learned anything from it and you don't get a chance to make it better. Um, it also improves the lives of, uh, of the users of your software because you're making this really solid piece of code uh, work for everyone and you know it's going to be solid. So every release, this, these TDD, these tests run really fast. That's the whole point at the bottom of that, that pyramid is about having fast executional tests. So you should be able to do a commit, they all run, they all pass, everyone's happy, you know you haven't broken anything. And because of that, your teammates can count on you and you can count on them because every time they do a commit, these tests run really fast and make everybody happy. And after a while, it does feel good to write it. It really does. So from a point of view, I've worked with a few developers that are really into this now and they can't write code any other way. If I said to them, can you just knock that up? No. I need tests. And that's really good. That's really cool sort of way of thinking because they actually learn a lot from what they're doing and find mistakes with it. So um, there's the red green refactor. And these are really important. And, and, and the refactor piece is the most important piece for it, for my, in my opinion. Um, and that's what we need to have clean, good code. So having red uh, means we've written a small test that shows our code doesn't work. So as soon as we've, we haven't written any code, so we write a test for it, and it's gonna fail straight away. Then the next thing we're gonna do is do the simplest, and it's really important, it's the simplest thing to make it pass. So if your test is to say, 
call this function with this variable should return true, then the quickest way you can make that pass is by having that function return true and nothing else. Because your next test will then say make it say false in this scenario, and then you can start to build it, do the simplest thing with it, and keep it moving that way. Because you're doing the very simplest thing you can do. Then once it's gone, um, it's gone green. Hey, we do the minimum work again. We get to refactor it. We'll look at it. Get any, we eliminate any duplication. We ensure that the code has clarity. That we haven't named the variable dob when we could have just used date of birth. Or uh, yeah, and is it the simplest it could be? Have we gone too far? So this is a really important piece around it. So we write a failing test, we make the test pass, and we refactor. And having the refactor piece is what keeps our code extremely clean. And we can also refactor our tests, because we may find as we move forward that that's what happens. Um, you can never trust a test that you've never seen fail. If you, if you write a test and it goes green straight away, there is something wrong. So you have to then go and change the test to make it actually fail so you know it's testing the right thing. It could be because you've already got another test that does it in a different way, or that feature's there. So therefore, have you got two tests doing the same thing? Is it a byproduct of your system? Should it have actually been doing that? There's different uh, schools of thought around that. Um, and sometimes to help make these tests cleaner, you can create helper functions that may do a lot of the, the grunt work for you. Um, because your tests should be, um, you should give the test code the same respect you give your production code, <clears throat> because it's a main part. Once you're, uh, I've seen it in a lot of places where tests, test code hasn't been given the right respect and it ends up being a ball of mud and no one wants to support it and then no one starts running them and then they start breaking and then you lose all that goodness. Um, I remember someone telling me once that the, if you have this mindset around testing at all the levels, that the byproduct of those tests is the product your customer wants. So if you run it, you know that's what your customer wants because you're, you're driving them off their requirements. It's quite a different way of thinking about it. So a few quotes from different people that I can't remember who said them, but basically, uh, you won't stay, stay agile without clean code. You can't have clean code without refactoring, and you can't refactor without good automated tests. So when someone says, I'm going to go and refactor, and there's no tests, they can't be refactoring. They're just causing a massive risk to your project in a massive way. Because it's only the test that will tell you that it still works. Because the whole point of it is you have this contract, if you like, an API contract around that piece of code that you're changing. And anything else that talks to it needs to talk to it in the same way. And the internals of it are what you're making better and you're refactoring those. And that's really quite powerful for um, moving forward with it. So we're now going to do TDD with the same process of build a person and build a house. So. We're going to clear the area in front of you. And um, in this respect, <laughs> so say you've got a clean area in front of you, and it's your program, right? It's the, it's the best program there is. It's fast. It doesn't do anything, but it's fast. There's no bugs. It's great. So um, we're going to now write our first test. So our first test is going to be, does the person exist? The answer is no. So yay, we've got a test, our first failing test. So what we're going to do is we can add a block. If we add one single block, that can be a person. So as far as we want, that is one person. So the person now exists. Our test is now passing. It's not impressive, but it's enough to represent what we want. And we've got it passing, so we're, we're, we're now rocking on. So once we've got a red test, what's the next thing? Well, we've got a red test. We've had a red test. We've got a green test. What's the next thing? Right. Probably not enough to refactor at this point. Um, but we've got to keep it in there. Is there something I could do? So if you're looking at it, this is the interesting piece. Now, if I look at this and go, OK, I see yours. Right. So here's a great one from Martin. Don't mean to pick on you, mate. But um, if every one of those little nobbles on top is a thousand pounds, you've been more expensive than this man, right? You've just cost me eight thousand pounds. He's cost me two. I want to see if anyone's cost me one. Yes, there's a one there, right? So that's as simple as it is. Can we make it simple? Um, and just keep that in mind that every one of them nobbles is actually going to cost you a thousand bucks. Let's see who does the cheapest. Uh... Oh, and if they're flat, if they're flat, they're still going to be a thousand. So. <laughs> um, 
Cool, so you know, in this case, we're, we're all good. So now we're gonna do the same thing to the house. So is there a house? No. So what do we do now? I'm gonna add a block. So now we have a house. We have a person and we have a house. The person won't fit in the house though. But that's not our requirement yet. That's a good point. So, so Roy just said the person doesn't fit in the house. Well, that's fine because your requirement so far is person, house. Because the next conversation you'll have with the business is, what's your next requirement? And then they give you them slowly but surely. But you may get this all up front and you know this and you drive it. But even if you had all those requirements up front, you still want to slice it in the smallest thing to go, well, that's releasable. I could give you a person in the house. It doesn't meet all these other requirements, but it's enough to get you going. It's your MVP. Or where does your MVP lie? So this is the next one. So is the house taller than the person? So a very simple piece. So we can just make them taller. So as long as the house is taller than the person, that's all that matters. Yeah, you can do refactoring on the other two, that's fine. Um, what I find really quite funny is that for... Who's the best one to pick? I'll just pick these two, that's good enough. So what some people could have done, if you had the two pieces like that, you know, there's your person, there's your house, is it taller? Then do that, then it is. That's what I've seen other people do, just turn it on its side. It's Lego, you can do anything with Lego, it's great, right? But again, it's just, what is the simplest thing I can do? If you've got two of those two ones, then you can't do that because it's the same all around. Um, you could just put a one block under it. But these are the sort of things we have to start thinking around. So we've got more failing tests and we've made it and we've done it and it's all great. So I've jumped ahead of myself, but that's fine. Um, so failure is a learning opportunity. If you're not failing, you're not learning. If you're not learning, what's the point? So we're always learning something from our code. It's really important. I say this to a lot of the developers I work with is, if you do something and you delete it, that's fine. You probably have learned something. You know, if, if we had management, if, if the management want to know how many codes of line have been added to the data, uh, added to the code base every day by each developer, they're the sort of places you want to get out of because adding lines of code is not the best thing. Sometimes deleting a whole load of code. I was on a project two years ago, we deleted 25,000 lines of code without testing, it was quite funny. Um, but this whole system carried on working. There was just a whole swathe of work that had been done by the offshore team that just never worked and was never used. Um, also, whenever we fixed one of their bugs, another five appeared, but um, that was generally how, how the life worked. And it was just because they were allowed to do what they wanted, there was no structure given to it. So again, we've, we've sort of gone through this, we've got the test passing, which is good. Uh, still pretty simple, still pretty nice and clean. Got probably about two, three blocks there. Um, so this is the next one. Can the person fit in the house? No. So we failed another test, which is great. We're learning a lot about the improvements that are needed to our code. Um, so let's do the minimum to pass the test. So I'm gonna let you guys go off and uh, spend 10 minutes or so trying to work out how you can get the person to fit in the house. See, amazing. Although the table over here didn't even notice it at all, but they, they were quiet anyway. So, <laughs> so yeah, there's some interesting questions there around define in the house. Does it have to have a roof? Does it have to have things around it? And I was just saying, I have to move into the next piece. Um, that that for me would be where you go back to the customer and ask them what their questions are around that. And then I think that's for me is where the BDD side of things sits outside. I haven't got the diagram for it. But if you remember the diagram of uh, 
the TDD around uh, red green refactor. If you put a bigger piece on the outside, that's your acceptance test. BDD, they're all the same name, meaning the same thing. But that can be your piece that you have all those rules that your customer wants, that it has four walls, it has a roof, and the person's able to go inside it. But your TDD piece is, can you get inside? Does it have four walls? Does it have that? And you slowly build it up as you're going over it. Um, but necessary does a house have it? It's, again, it's a house thing. We, we had a, um, our old boss of mine come up with a great scenario where uh, many teams probably do this, where you seem to just over deliver or go down the wrong route. Or, so the requirement comes in for shelter. That's the requirement. And the first thing we start to do is start to build a garden because that's obviously what you want when you've got shelter. And then we start building the driveway and then not getting to the actual point when all they actually want is a tent or a cave, and then a tent, and then a house, and then start building it up, and that's our MVP. And that's very much the same as this, is give it the bare minimum. What's the bare minimum I need to pass the test? But ask the extra questions. So, software requirements. Uh, I think it's quite straightforward, really. It should work. Um, I think it's a great concept where someone says, uh, I finished this story, and it works. What? Surely, I finished the story implies that it works. If someone says the two together, then there's something wrong. Even on the other. Must be understandable. So you can actually read through the code. You can understand it. And that's both for your tests um, and for your production code. If your tests aren't understandable, then you can't maintain them. And then updatable is making it ma maintainable. Can I plug into it? Can I add things to it? Use all the solid principles around single responsibility principle, Lipson, oh, top of my head, all gone out. Um, but that's, that's one key piece. Uh, for some reason, I faded that one. <coughs> but anyway, I should have tested my presentation. Um, but it must be testable. That's really important. important. It must be understandable. Because it's, it's for two different people. So that the first one, which is now throwing me out, is by Rob C. Martin. Uncle Bob, who did Clean Code, great, another great book, 100% recommend that to a lot of people. He does one called Clean Code and Clean Coders. He also has cleancoders.com. Um, clean Code is about how we write code and do things like that. Clean Coders is how you are as a code practitioner, a codesmith. Um, you know, I know a few people get hung up on the craftsmanship um, side of things, but as a codesmith, I think that's a better word for it. That's, that's something you're doing with it, very much like the blacksmith world. Um, so that's his three, and then this guy, Zachary Spencer, uh, from, uh, from the extreme programming side of things, comes in with it. It must be testable, understandable, browsable, and explainable. Um, although explainable and understandable should come hand in hand, but you know, they work really quite well. So it's different ways of thinking about your code, and certainly when you start thinking that way, you, you start to question the ways you used to do it. And, We've all done it before and looked at a piece of code and said, what idiot wrote that? And then you realize in the check-in history, it was you um, two days ago. Because uh, you've just learned something. That's just generally what happens and we've all done it. Um, and if you're a total dick like I am at times, I'll blame someone else and tell them and then realize it's me. Um, but anyway, so removing the three Cs. So we want to remove the clutter. So comments. There's a lot of the whole school of thought around having comments in your code to explain it. Well, if your code explains itself well enough, you don't need the comments. If a function is called add, add time to date of birth or add dates to time of birth, then it, it, it's saying what it's doing. Um, where if it says time DOB, it's like, what the hell does that do? You have to put a comment in it. Um, and if you feel that you have to write a comment, then maybe your code is a bit unclear. Um, but the other thing is, is if you write a comment and the moment you put an and in your comment, your function's doing too much. That's a real big thing. Um, you can look at the comment, you can extract out the code to a function with the name of the comment. Think of the comment in there, you can change it around. Um, the other thing is, and we've all seen it, is that comments don't get deleted because people feel that they're important, but the code that they relate to does get deleted or does get moved. Comment here, function here, load of stuff here, they don't relate anymore, it's all lies. Um, remove the complexity. You know, it can be, can, it, can we do this in the simplest way? I had someone do something in a piece of code. Um, there was an array function that worked really well, um, although it would 
Apparently it was choked a thousand in an array. So he thought being clever and showing his prowess, he just dropped, dropped down into Java and we were using a, a, a Java runtime and he dropped down to Java to do it. And he said, this is really performant now. You know, if we've got more than a thousand in that array, it'll be really good. And I went, yeah, that'll only ever have 50 in it. And he's like, what? So we didn't listen to the requirements. We will never have more than a thousand in that array. You've made it really fast for when we do have that, which is another question around, you know, make it work before you make it faster is an important thing as well. So, you know, sometimes complexity uh, is one area. And I think we've probably worked with devs in the past that they got their seniority by how complex they can make code, how you can obfuscate everything. And it's like really difficult. Only, only Steve can look at that. And you're like, yeah, but I could do that. In, it's, it's, uh, sort of uh, name that tune. I could write that in five lines. I could write that in four. Yes, great, go for it. Um, and then people start doing it in functional programming and then no one really knows what's going on or APL. Uh, and that's then leads on to the next bit is really remove the cleverness. Um, you know, clear and simple makes it easier for everyone to read it. Um, you know, uh, using prime numbers. What, what did I write there? Oh, I did this bitwise and used prime numbers and then blah, 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 blah. You know, you're not going to understand it in six in six months time. So it's about really taking your, your, uh, your cleverness out. So now we've removed the three, uh, the, the three C's. Now we're gonna remove the three D's. Duplication, duplication, and duplication. So we don't wanna repeat ourselves. We certainly don't wanna do, uh, so the dry principle, don't repeat yourself. We also probably don't want to do wet, which is right every time. Um, you know, you don't want to go and change that leap year function in five places. Um, or was it six or seven? I don't know how many places we had that leap code, piece of code. Um, it's also around if you have a function that looks very similar to another function, can you get it as close as possible to then eradicate one? Um, yes, we've got the anti if statement brigade that obviously we've got a function that goes and does stuff, that's quite fun. Um, but there is the other side to it. If I have a function that does almost what I want, but slightly different, then I'll create, I'll duplicate that function and make or call that function, then do the change I want to happen. It's happening in one place, but then I may couple them together. So it's about some design issues around that, but that's a, that's a different topic. So refactoring. So refactoring is the process of changing a software system in such a way that it does not alter the external behavior of the code uh, and improves the internal structure. Spelling mistake, as usual. Right, so there is a second bag for everyone. So if I can give a handful here, if you can pass them backwards as well, I'm hoping there's going to be enough. There should be enough for everyone. There's three of you there. So the, the bag with the red top on it is the... Uh, I can ask you to pass them over to the table at the back as well. It's tight. Right, so we're now going to do some refactoring. <laughs> right, so our refactoring piece is with bag two. And what we're going to do with this is we're going to use the two by one bricks, so these bricks, not the plates. And now we're going to build them in a stack that is green. And now I realize with the lights, this is gonna not work too well with people that are colorblind with my whites and yellows. So I apologize for the contrast I've decided to use. So green at the top, yellow, blue, blue, yellow, red, white, yellow, red. So it looks like that. So green at the top, followed by yellow, followed by two blues, followed by a yellow, followed by a red, followed by a white, followed by a yellow, followed by a red. <laughs> right. So for our next one, we are going to uh, explain this piece. So each color band is a block of logic in your code. So we're going to refactor this code. So the yellow code um, is our leap year function that's in three different places, um, which happens. And the blue code is that bit of code no one wants to touch because it's a thousand lines of code. No one wants to touch it, and everyone has to scroll through it every time you touch that bloody class, that God function, or that God component. 
So remind, remember we're going to use dry, we're not going to repeat ourselves, we're going to have once and once only, and notice how there are repeats of the same colour bands as we spoke about. So with decent IDE tooling, you can sort of grab a piece of code and say extract function and it'll go and do all that cool stuff for you. Um, so in the way we're going to do it, so I'll turn that light off again, make it easier to see. Um, so the, the way we're going to do it is basically we're going to replace uh, the blocks and then we're going to put in plates and the plates are going to be function calls. So the block of code is somewhere else. So we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to replace the first big yellow brick with a small yellow plate and then place the yellow block to the bottom. So in this first refactor, it should look something like this. So we're going to take, we'll take, that green, we'll take that yellow one out, we'll stick it to the bottom and then we'll put that plate in place of it and then it should look like that. So our code's got a little bit more complicated at this point in time. Yeah, all good, all good, all good. Yeah, I just got caught out by someone over there by raising it. I went, no, that's good. <laughs> it turns out they put an extra plate at the bottom, didn't they, Roy? Yeah, good. You can test it against everyone else's. Don't trust you now. <laughs> that's good enough. How are we looking on this side? Yeah, looks good. You're the control one for that table. Yep. Yeah. All good. Right. So, this is where then I get all mixed up. So our next thing is, we've done that one refactor. Now we want to replace the next yellow brick with a yellow plate. So we'll take the next one. But this time, with the yellow brick we're replacing, we're just going to throw that piece of code away because we're going to delete it because we've already got that code at the bottom. And then once we've tested that, because what we've what we got to remember to do is every time we do one refactor, we run our tests. Because we don't want to do five refactors, run our tests and then work out which one of the refactors broke it. And because our tests are really fast, if you test against yourself, I'm not going to run around. Um, but if you test it against each of yourselves, you'll be able to see it all hang together. So then the last piece is to take the last block of the original code base and replace that. So now we've got green, yellow plate, two blues, yellow plate, red, yellow, yellow, red, white, yellow plate, red, yellow block. Jesus. <laughs> In the next section, yeah, in the next section, we'll be doing yellow lorries and lollies. <laughs> um, so now, just because that's the important piece around this, is that we're running the test every time we do it. We check it against each other, and if someone else is wrong, and if there's three or four of you on a table and one person's got it wrong, you're going to spot that one person that's different. Unless three people get it really wrong and that one person is right, then we don't know where we're going to be. So now we have our leak code function in one place, right at the bottom. It's called in the other places. Um, you know, so if only if we had that leap year... What did I put on there? That was it. So there's the leap year thing, isn't it? That we all think it's if it's divisible by four, it comes in, but we also find out later that if, it isn't, if it's divisible by 100 or 400, then that changes the game. But now we've only got to change it in one place and not in three places. Um, so that's a really good, important piece for us. So now we're going to keep this up and we're going to move to the next piece. Now, what we don't want to do is to keep scrolling through. We've got that big code base, and every time we go through the code base, we've got to go, Ooh, okay, that's what I want. So we've got to keep going through those thousand lines of that code that no one wants to touch. So what we're going to do is take the blue piece out, and we're going to put a blue, a blue, uh, a blue plate there, and then we're going to move the blue piece to the bottom of the code base. Gonna try it again. Green black, green block, yellow plate, blue plate, yellow plate, red block, white block, yellow plate, red block, yellow block, blue block. Right. There is two in there, but it's, that's one piece of code. So it only needs one function call to it. That was the trick I put into the bags to see what people would think, because there was two yellow, two blue ones in it, because it was just easier to pick them out that way some strange reason in my mind. 
So because we've only got one there, we've moved the code out of the way. So now when we're using the code base, it's nice and clean. It's a lot cleaner for us to use. And we're not having to scroll through a thousand lines of code that we never want to touch. So for our next piece is we're going to carry on swapping the big blocks for those. So remember, the first block you replace, you stick to the bottom. And the second time you remove a block, you uh, dispose of it correctly. But it works, it's awesome. <laughs> okay, so um, I actually jumped ahead on a few people on this and said readability, so let's extract the green and white. And some people are asking why, and then I realized I've jumped ahead. Um, <laughs> we have it there so we can actually read our code. So at the moment, we've just got all these functions sitting there, um, hanging around. We've got these code blocks. So it just allows us to start to look at it. And if we put the code in the way they're ordered, it means that when we come to look at the function, they're in the order we're being called in, so we can actually get a bit of readability and see what happens. We still need the actual call because we're making calls to it, um, but we're, it actually makes the code easier to read, and obviously we should keep on testing. So I'm hoping most people have got that far um, in a roundabout way from me jumping ahead. So, lights are still off, that's good. So clarity, you know, remember some of the requirements for good, so good software. It needs to be easy to read and update. Um, so one of the things we can do is rearrange the blocks so that they're in the same color order. So we get green, yellow, blue, red, and white blocks at the bottom, because that's the order they're called in, it makes it easier to do. Um, we can also split things off. So we may then decide, okay, um, the green uh, and the yellow, they're date functions, so we'll have that in another class. And then this horrible piece of blue code will stick off somewhere else. And now all of a sudden, when we come to edit this this app that we're doing, we're only having to go through little pieces of code and we can test those individually and separately rather than test them everywhere else. So already part of the refactoring piece is that as we're testing it, we get to see that we've got a nice simple code base that has different classes. So it's a way of splitting a God class or a God component or whatever out to multiple pieces. And then the interesting piece that we had in there about why is that so big, why don't we refactor this, is then that can be another story. And how you go about refactoring, that's a different thing. but maybe you'll break that out into separate functions that things can call and make it easier. Um, but yeah, that horrible blue code that no one wants to touch. Right. So we're at the hour mark about now. Um, and we're going to move into a different section for this. Okay, so this next piece is uh, to work, each table will work together, but then we'll split off into pairs inside the tables if that works. If it doesn't, then stay as a three. Um, or an odd number, that's fine. I um, just wanted to highlight the bit there about pair programming, mob programming, because mob programs all the hip, hipsters do these days. Um, I spoke about this in some of my other presentations, but it's about having all the right people in the right place at the right time. Um, so you would have your testers, your developers, product owner, all in the same room, looking at a projector with four keyboards or how many you need and people swapping keyboards the whole time. It's just pair program on steroids guy called Woody Zool, who's in town right now, because he's obviously at Manchester and uh, he's at uh, XP 2016. Um, he's sort of coined this and he says his team becomes 10 times faster because your decisions aren't happy. You're not going, oh, I have to get a tester to test that or I have to go and ask the DBA what the question is. If the whole team is there and they make the decision there and then. But he's got no real metrics on it, he says, because he didn't keep track of them, but it's quite a cool way of doing it. Now, got a note to myself on here about having a control group. Um, I don't believe this will ever happen in the way that it happened the first time, but I'll explain that later. So was there a team of developers somewhere that were all sitting together that have sort of done TDD before or have an understanding of it? All right, so I'll let it be you guys. You're my control group. So as a control group, <laughs> as a control group, you don't have to write any tests. 
You can go sit on the other table. <laughs> right, so for that, you're obviously going to need some more bricks. We're going to make it nice and difficult. Right, okay. So, unfortunately, the, the original one of this was that sort of topic, but it's not. Uh, unfortunately, I can't help you there. So, what we're going to do is we're going to do the Lego Sim Town. So our user story is, in order to have a town to run, the mayor requires a small town comprised of a family, a house, a tree, an animal, and a vehicle. One person in the team as well can be the product owner so they can decide what the questions are rather than everyone shout out all the different questions, that's fine. So, each table create their own sim town um, and as a table, you work in pairs to create each element of the larger town. So there's four or five, six of you at a the table, there'll be three pairs working together. But as a team, you say, well, can you create the family? Can you create the tree? Can you feel this? Um, decide who wants to be each of the elements. Work in pairs, write down, a, and we're going to do tests. So there are pa paper and pens. And before you, write, before you do any pieces of these, I want you to write a test and then make it pass. And write as many tests as you can. I've got a few more bits of paper left. But as a team, we want to do that. So at the end, we'll go through every table and we'll say, show, you, show me your test and show me it passing. And remember that they've got to pass it all the time. Now you may decide that that test is invalid now because that happens. As your requirements change, a test will get invalidated. So you can put a cross through it because you'll throw that test away because it's no longer required, but it will show that the test-driven element of it did move forward. So, um, don't need to worry about refactoring at this point because we've only got half an hour left. So we want to move forward on it as quick as possible. So we've got a couple there to get you started. Is the house at least X bricks tall? Is the tree the same size as the house? Is the animal smaller than the person? But I'll let you guys decide on that. You can say how many people are in the family. The concepts are there. So they're the ones we've got left. A family, a house, a tree, an animal, a vehicle. So write your test, make it pass, decide who's going to build what together. Crack on. If you need more bricks, give me a shout. As long as I see your tests passing, you can have more bricks. <laughs>
Right, so with you guys, I'd like you to read out your test and show that it's still passing. Right, so we've got the vehicle must fit three people. So we've got the vehicle three people. Uh, <laughs> Not securely, but that's fine. <laughs> we've got the vehicle must fit in the garage. It's the garage. Uh, we've got our requirements that the tree must be tall in the house. It was just taller, that's fine. <laughs> what does the family, what's the rules for the family? Family has three people, yeah, and the child must wear a hat. Yeah. And the rules for the animal? The animal must have four legs, the animal must be a giraffe, the animal must be taller than the tree, the animal must have a baby animal. The baby animals are smaller than the, the Fair enough. Still could have been simpler, but we're not doing refactoring. That's fine. Right, this group, who's going to kick us off? Just about. Yeah. <laughs> What was the next bit? Animals and trees. Animals, uh, animals are smaller than the parent. Uh, the animal is smaller than the child. The child is wider than the middle. And the animal is close to all the races. The <laughs> well, some owners do look like their dogs, I suppose. <laughs> and for our tree. Does a tree have a base? Is a tree two bricks high? Does nobody have a flat requirement? Is it a tree harbour two loops? Um, is a tree smaller than the house? Is a tree larger than the human? And does a tree harbour go across the So, the interesting one on that would be does the tree have at least one leaf? And then you've got another one that says, does the tree have more than two leaves? Yeah. So I would have killed the first one. You know, that test gone, that's fine. Because you've, you've learned more about your system as you've done it, and that's perfectly good. So yeah, that's great. Until the next requirement comes in, that says it only has one leaf, but then that's when you do refactoring. Done that one, right, this table. Is the tree taller than the animal? Yes. Um, does the animal have two legs? Does the vehicle have wheels? <coughs> Obviously. Sorry, I'm standing by. Uh, does the tree have at least two branches? Can the animal ride the vehicle? It's the first one that's cared about the animal in the vehicle. <laughs> Everyone else is, everyone's done the family in the car, but everyone's left out the animal. The animal can't get in there, he's part of the family. <laughs> yep. Uh, is there two adults? <laughs> <laughs> oh, two adults taller than a child? Yep. Can the people fit in the house? Branded. And does the house have a fire escape? <laughs> <laughs> it did have a fire escape, you got rid of it. <laughs> Sorry, let me put it back. Why don't I change his mind again? <laughs> cool, good work, guys. Well, well, <laughs> what do we have here? This looks exciting. Go for it. Discussion. Uh, so um, we started off with uh, animal. Does it have a body? Yes. Uh, does it have a head? Yes. Uh, does it have arms? They are. It's a rabbit, so it moves like this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> does it have legs? Yes. Can it fit in the house? Yes. Uh, can the arms move? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> can the legs move? <coughs> yes. Um, the tree is the tree as big as the house? Yes. Is the tree? Ah, uh, what was the question? 
as this tree as big as the house? It's bigger. Uh, by volume. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> This is, this is where we all get nickety pickety with it when the project manager says one thing and the developer says another. Is the tree bigger than the animal? Is the tree bigger than the person? Is the tree bigger than the vehicle? <laughs> no, it's a big tree. <laughs> it's a big vehicle. <laughs> does it have a body? Uh, does it have a base? Oops. Does it have foliage? So they all pass. Vehicle, does it exist? Well, it didn't at the time when we started going round, but apparently it does, so we need to write more text for that. <laughs> <laughs> and now it fits the family and the rabbit. But there's no text, so... Uh, we'll get there in the end. Right, and the final table. That'll be you guys, in case you didn't know. I have a vehicle, I have a fit in the vehicle, family sitting in the vehicle. Yeah. yeah. Uh, does it run on snow? <laughs> <laughs> and we also had another requirement, all the same colour. But after talking to the product owner and giving them the Amazon delivery time for their guys. Um, no, we, uh, we, um, we um, did that one. requirement. Uh, and the tree, so uh, is the tree bigger than the vehicle? Yeah. Is the tree smaller than the house? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is the top of the tree wider than the base? Yeah. Good work. Fair enough. Uh, we've got the uh, dog somewhere. Yeah. Yep, the uh, dog has a full Dalmatian here. So it'll drink. It's definitely smaller than the person and can use the house. So it's certainly fitting there quite happily. That's all we have for the animal. Cool. Um, house, I think. Um, so our family, we weren't quite so nuclear with it. <laughs> all we required was greater than one, so greater than zero parents and greater than zero children, and that would make us eight. <laughs> uh, they have to be the same colour and the parent has to be bigger than the child. <laughs> Actually saying that now is yes. No, it's diversity. <laughs> That's awesome. Right. <laughs> so it's really interesting how everyone had the same requirements other than these guys, and uh, everyone came up with something totally different. I think that's, that's generally what happens in coding as well. Um, everyone comes up with different solutions. Uh, but hopefully from that, if, we, if I'd said to you to keep doing the refactoring pieces, I'm hoping a lot of these would have been a lot smaller and cheaper, but um, we've, got, we've got time to do. Uh, so that's cool. So. Um, just a quick review of what we've sort of spoken over. Turn the light over. Just in the interest of time. So uh, we did a little bit around test driven development, touched on design a little bit, some refactoring, pair programming or pair, pair building if you like. Bit of developer speak in there, an experience of working on a software team of stuff like that. Now this is my obligatory um, slide that I put in everything. Programmers hardest tasks, 49% say naming things. Yeah. Uh, which generally is what we do. 16% is explaining what I do or don't do. 10% is estimating time on complete to complete tasks. 8% is dealing with other people. 8% is working with someone else's code. Uh, implementing functionality you disagree with was 3%. Writing documentation was 2%. Writing tests was 2%. And designing a solution was 2%. I just find that quite an interesting thing. That was from uh, Cura. Or Ubuntu forums, 2013, 2014, I think. It's just quite an interesting thing. I just find naming things. And my antidote on that is naming functions and naming things in code should be like naming your first child, because you're going to probably end up supporting it for 18 years. <laughs> um, that's my opinion. So our four elements of simple design is it passes the tests, it minimizes duplication, it maximizes clarity, and it has fewer elements as required. So the last piece of this is around a closing circle. So what did you learn today? What surprised you today? What will you do differently in the future? So if anyone wants to answer some of these, or maybe one from each table, <laughs> if I'm going to have to force it on people. 
Right, don't write test you get a rocket ship. Okay. <laughs> Anyone from the back table? Uh, what surprised me was you did talk about TED and then when you got given blocks and wanted to shut off and made the animals part of the right test. A few people did. But you're right, yeah, maybe I didn't make that clear enough. That's a good feedback point. Anything else? Any other thoughts? Anything that surprised you from? That there was somewhere affordable to get that going. Affordable to get that going. I'm surprised at how, how much, when you refactored the, the, the code blocks, that they looked like the classes, you know, a well designed class. At the yeah. End. Yeah. It's cool. Anything else? What would you do different? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Requirements need to be clear. Yeah. You had no, you were just given a random amount of stuff to do, but you're right. I think writing, writing tests and then building them up all in one place and seeing how it works to create a test or to create a requirement to get them to be mm. Yeah. Software development's hard, right? So, um, what will you do differently in the future? Anyone want to answer that one? For me, it's as a BA, it's definitely kind of. Sticking it to the man. <laughs> Making sure that the business is um, understands what developers are thinking, or tries to, and make sure the developers have the understand the business thinking. I've been that into loop because it's just as shown from those 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 Lego examples. There, one thing could be said, but what gets delivered could be if there's no communication, it becomes completely the opposite of what seems. And that's that's the thing with the English language. Is it so? open-ended and, and, and stuff like that, which is where BDD comes in. Behavior-driven development is about having a ubiquitous language. So if you're not going down that route and you're doing more of the TDD bit, the bit to get involved in is showing that the tests work, but then it gets a bit, the business don't really get JUnit result packs and stuff, um, which is where BDD actually comes in even more because you're getting in plain English. But if people can talk through it and say, this is what I expect it to do, these are my inputs and outputs, can someone talk that through in an English way to the business? That maybe maybe your role between the, the uh, your role between the two may make sure that the developers are going in the right direction, which is always difficult. To make sure we're there. Anyone else with thoughts? So the um, the bit I missed out, I didn't miss out on, is the reason why the uh, refactoring piece is with the two bits and makes it really fiddly. It's because that's how hard code is. So there is elements that cross over. So, uh, thank you very much. Hopefully you got stuff out of this. Um, what I will do with my slide deck is I will publish it, make sure uh, Roy puts it up on, the, on uh, the blog. I will put the link to BritLink in it and the guy that I use, because he's great, he sends me stuff really quick. Uh, and also what you need to order if you want to make your own packs. Um, sometimes I've said take the packs away, but as, <laughs> as I was having discussions with Roy around it, it's like, how many people have booked in? 50, so I now need to make 50 packs. There was originally 100 of each of the packs, and now I've ended up with like less than 50, and I've already made 50 again. Um, but yeah, I can give you the list that you want to get, and if you want to do it in your own place, take the slide deck, um, or indeed ask me to come along, and I'll happily help people uh, do this in their own place, because sometimes in, in your own environment, if you try to teach your own team, they ignore you. If someone external comes in, it could be useful. Um, and we've, like, we've done it in an hour and a half, two hours, uh, so it's a pretty cheap session. Cool, well thank you. Uh, any discussion points that people outside of the three that I asked? Conscious of time. No? Cool, well again, thank you very much everyone and uh, take care.